You're listening to Big World Network. Zygote, Episode 1, Election Night, Part 1 Written by Robert S. C. Cutler Read by Willow Wood Indianapolis, Indiana, 2108 Capital of the United States Joshua Day walked out of the frigid November air and into the stuffy yet fragrant barbershop. Two of the three chairs had middle-aged customers, sitting draped in white sheets with their eyes closed, while the barbers talked and snipped away. The third chair was vacant, except for a worn-out fedora and a photo of a smiling, elderly man with a full head of shocking white hair. The counter and mirror behind the chair were adorned in Catholic prayer candles and pictures of saints. You're a week overdue, Professor, the barber manning the middle chair said. His salt and pepper curly hair was long and unkempt, as were his bushy eyebrows and hair sprouting from his ears. I'm not a professor, Gino, Joshua corrected. I just teach high school biology. Someday you will be, mark my word. Smartest kid at Bishop Calloway. Sure was. Stenny, the customer in Gino's chair, said. It's a shame Calloway didn't hire you, Frank Albertson, the barber at the first chair, said. Tall and fit, his head and face were clean-shaven, except for a thick, black moustache that he had trained to curl up at the ends. Damn shame, Frank's customer, Mr. Hibbert, added. I have good mind to write a letter to the diocese to let them know exactly how I feel, Gino said. How we all feel, Stenny added. Add my name to that letter. I'll sign it, Mr. Hibbert exclaimed. It isn't like Bishop Calloway turned me down, Joshua said. They offered me a nice salary. Gino stopped cutting Stenny's hair and stepped around the chair. Why would a good Catholic boy like you turn down the chance to serve the church? And the Pope, Frank said while snipping away. My heart, Joshua replied. Your heart? What's that supposed to mean? asked Gino. You're not planning on leaving the church like so many of those. Watch it, Gino. They might be listening. Frank warned. Gino crossed his burly, hairy arms and glanced at his reflection in the large mirror hanging on the wall. Let those lowlife government... Gino! Frank interrupted. Now's not the time to speak your mind. You know I can't run this shop by myself. If only Tony was still alive, God rest his soul. Gino crossed himself. He wouldn't be afraid to speak his mind. I need the medical insurance for my heart, and only the state's insurance will cover any procedures I might have to have in the future. Joshua explained. The diocese doesn't offer that. You mean they're not allowed to? Gino grumbled as he returned back to the chair. Freedom of religion, my foot. At least they still allow us to worship the way we want to, Frank said. Mr. Hibbert nodded his head in agreement, almost causing Frank to cut his ear. We could be like those other poor bastards and get put on reservations. Religious colonies, not reservations, Frank corrected. Just a step away from prison, Gino said. And for what? Worshipping God in a different way to those hypocrites? Just makes me sick to my stomach, those Protestant bastards. 
stick their families out in the middle of nowhere and see how they like it. Maybe if Espinosa gets elected tonight, things will get better, Joshua suggested. Don't believe the hype, kid, Frank said. Those politicians talk a good game, but as soon as they're voted into office, they noto to the highest bidder. Gino took a barber's small hand broom and swept away the stray clippings from the back of Stenny's neck and shirt. Removing the drape, he snapped it in the air a few times and then patiently waited for Stenny to get out of the chair. Did you vote, Professor? asked Gino. Not yet. I thought I'd get a haircut first and then go over. Frank shook his head. The lines are going to be long. You should have gone first thing this morning. Oh, is that what you guys did? asked Joshua. Gino took a sleek, black, cylindrical scanner out of a charger and waved it back and forth over the back of Stenny's neck. Only Mr. Government suck up over there, he referred to Frank. As soon as word got out about the new and improved spyware, hardware, Frank corrected. Frank over there was one of the first in line. Gino continued. If you're talking about the bindle, every man, woman and child in the United States was supposed to have gotten one by July 31st, Frank said. You can't vote, drive or buy prescription drugs without it. Gino shrugged his shoulders and hit the scanner with the palm of his hand. All three things I don't need or want to do. Is your chip broken? He asked Stenny. I can't even get a beep. It gets worse by the day. Stenny complained. Damn fools let it slip when they installed it. Try scanning more to the right, Gino. As soon as Gino passed the scanner over the right side of Stenny's neck, it lit up in green flashing lights and beeped rhythmically. The usual tip today? Of course. Stenny sighed. I voted today. Have you? The scanner spoke with the voice of a young woman. Doesn't sound a thing like you, Stenny. Gino laughed. I was just about to ask you out. Frank laughed, winking and blowing a kiss Stenny's way. Stenny put on his coat and grumbled just before he walked out the door. The both of you can kiss my ass. You're next, Professor. Gino patted the chair. I know what Stenny was talking about, Joshua said as he climbed up into the barber's chair. The back of my neck has been sore since they changed out the chips. Gino lifted up the back of Joshua's hair and examined the area just below his skull. The soft skin was red and raised in the shape of a perfect square. Do you still have some of that aloe vera salve? He asked Frank. Frank pulled open one of the worn, wooden drawers and dug through a mess of papers, a collection of combs and bottles of cologne and aftershave. You're in luck, he announced, while tossing a small tube that was rolled up almost all the way to the cap. You ought to have this looked at, Professor, Frank said as he applied the clear gel to the infected area. I have an appointment in December which I made in June, Joshua replied. Gino rolled his eyes. Figures. Why so long? asked Frank. Seems to be that I'm not the only one who had issues with the new implant. Some people have had to have their bindles removed and temporarily inserted in the underside of their forearms. Mary and Joseph, Gino exclaimed. That's why I didn't let those butchers touch me. That, and because you're an old stubborn mule. Frank laughed. Mr. Hibbert laughed as well. The antibiotics I take for my heart have kept the infection at bay, so it's not as bad as it could be, I guess. I'll try my best to keep away from it, Gino said. The usual? Joshua closed his eyes. Yes, please, just above the ears. 
The bank of mirrors lining the wall, opposite of the barber chairs, lit up like a television in colourful graphics, as fanfare music crackled through a dust-covered speaker hanging above the entrance to the back room. A digital clock display in the centre mirror blinked the time of 3.58pm. The President of the United States theme song played, followed by the voice of President Douglas. Gino Molinaro and Joshua Day. You've only three hours left before the polls close. Exercise your right as an American citizen and be sure to vote for your favorite candidate. That's so weird. It actually sounds like the president is calling us out for not voting yet. Joshua said. I wonder how they do that. Maybe with computer software? You know, that new invention. Frank mocked as he stepped away from the chair and Mr. Hibbert. Ha ha. Joshua rolled his eyes. Frank cleared his throat. <clears throat> Gino, it's just about four. With a heavy sigh, Gino put down his barber's shears and stepped around his chair as well. Every day it's the same thing. And... Every day we have to hear you complain, Frank glared. At 3.59 and 50 seconds, all four men eyed the clock display on the mirror, took a deep breath and closed their eyes. When the display reached 4pm, the mirror went blank, the lights dimmed, and the men took a sudden breath and clenched every muscle in their bodies. Five seconds later, the mirrors once again were illuminated with colourful graphics and the lights returned to normal. Oh, man, <laughs> I hate that, Joshua laughed. I remember when we only had to go through that once a week, Mr Hibbert said, while Frank applied hot shaving cream to the back of his neck. I remember when we had to be by our computers to get software updates, Frank added. That's because you're old, <laughs> Gino laughed. Frank smirked. I'm younger than you, Mathasala. Do you think Douglas will get a second term? Asked Joshua. Does the Douglas family own most of the United States? Gino answered. Gino, enough already, Frank yelled. I can speak my mind. Free country. Tell that to Father Lease. He voiced his opinion too many times, and now he's out in western Kansas running a 30-member parish. I wondered what happened to him, Mr. Hibbert said. He was in the middle of giving morning mass when they came and escorted him out of the cathedral, Frank added. You mean when they handcuffed and dragged him away, Gino said. Now I remember, Mr. Hibbert said. I think I was twelve. I was an altar boy, Joshua said. We were told Father Lease was wanted by the FBI for bank fraud. Did you know we've had a Douglas in the White House for just about 40 out of the 90 years since reorganization, Mr. Hibbert said. Presidential complex, not White House, Frank corrected. I believe you meant occupation or overthrow, not reorganization, Gino said. Mr. Hibbert shook his head. No, I meant reorganization. I have no plans on being moved to the windswept plains of western Kansas. See, Gino, that's the proper way to speak while in public, Frank lectured. What about all of the commercials, warning us of factory shutdowns and massive unemployment if Espinosa gets elected? Asked Joshua. Frank glided a straight razor over the back of Mr. Hibbert's neck. Just ads, kid. I wouldn't worry about it. Two tanks and a dozen army personnel carriers rolled by the barbershop at high speed, rattling the plate glass windows and front door. All four men paused and turned their heads toward the street. 
and the troop build up around the perimeter of the city, Joshua added. Frank took another swipe with the razor. Just security precautions. This is one of the nastiest presidential campaigns I can remember. I've never seen the country so divided. One of your security precautions just pulled up outside and is headed this way. Joshua motioned toward the front door. Mary and Joseph. Gino crossed himself. Walking into the stuffy barbershop, dragging the frigid air in with him, a man wearing a black duster with a pin of the American flag on one lapel and the Douglas family insignia on the other, removed his neatly creased fedora and smiled. I'm looking for a Mr. Gino Molinaro. Big World Network. Music by Kevin McLeod.